We have a great video for you all today all about our photo storage and backup approach, plus some of the more popular options that might be right for you. But before we do that, I have a very, very, very special guest today ready to open up the video. You all know her, and she is who you came here to see. So let me step aside for just a moment. Hello, everyone. I'm nowhere near 100% recovered from spine surgery yet and from the months that I was bedridden leading up to surgery, but I am on the rebound. It's going to be a long road back, but you will be seeing me in videos in addition to Raymond from here on out. So I'm excited. But I do want to be candid with you. I was really suffering before surgery from, you know, a pain perspective, but also from being out of touch with all of you for so much longer than I ever would have thought. You know, this job of mine is a lot of work, but it's also my passion. So I'm gonna say thank you again to everyone that has written to me in email and Instagram DMs and comments on videos. Those encouragements and interactions have helped me immensely to stay sane. And I know that a lot of you know that spine surgery is no walk in the park. And Anyway, I'll be popping back into this video a little bit later, but Raymond is leading the charge. And on that note, let's have a round of applause for Raymond. Raymond, come here. You jumped in. He cared for me. He cared for our family and he took the reins. Come here on the channel while I was unable. Thank you, my love. He's been incredible. But and you know what? Many of you have commented on Raymond's approach and his style. And I've suggested to Raymond that he appear more on screen. Yeah. And I know that a lot of you from comments, you think that you like him too. So if you do want to see more of his opinions and his opinions on technique, on gear, on editing and all of that stuff, let me know in the comments. But I'm not ready to be done talking yet. I want to talk about the sponsor of this portion of the video, KEH. They've been buying and selling pre-owned photography gear since 1979. We were customers of theirs, and then about a couple of years ago, we began working with them. Their processes for purchasing used gear from them and for selling your used gear to them are easy and smooth. Raymond told you last month about recommending KEH to a friend. I recommended them to a friend that came and visited me while I was awaiting surgery. She was looking for a small point and shoot camera for traveling. They were headed out on a cruise. I recommended the Sony RX100 series and the Mark 7 in particular because she wants a good amount of range. But I told her to check KEH because why not save a little bit of money? And anyway, I trust them for my own gear and to recommend them to family and friends and including all of you. So I will add my affiliate links to KEH in the description of this video. If you use my codes, you can get a discount on the purchase of gear or a bonus on the sale of your gear. Plus, using those links helps let KEH know to continue supporting this channel. And thank you to KEH for those discounts and those bonuses and, and for partnering with this channel. Check them out, they're pretty awesome. Today's video is all about storage and backups, but it's really a story too. With Lee largely unable to go out and take pictures, I've taken the lead on a review of the Panasonic S5 II. We've had this camera in our hands uh, before public announcement, and months prior to that, Lee was a very excited beta tester of a pre-release version of the camera, sharing her feedback with Panasonic. It was an honor for her to be asked to help, and it gave us some early opinions on the camera before this fully baked version appeared on our doorstep as a loner. I've been out shooting with the camera, and we'll be sharing all of our thoughts in an upcoming video but I'll tell you this initially, I'll give you a sneak peek. It is what we wanted and expected, an update to the Panasonic S5, an L-mount camera, which we purchased ourselves, and the main attractions are the new phase detection autofocus, which a lot of people have been looking forward to and hoping for, and more video options than ever, and still with pure dedication to still images. And while we would have loved to have all of our thoughts over to you on the day of launch, which was a few weeks ago, uh, that was not able to happen. Uh, but there are two great times to publish a camera review. One is on that launch day, but that is past. 
Two is after a ton of experience with the camera. So that's the approach we're taking for this review. It might even be a better one. Um, and you'll see that review in the near future. Overall, we felt that our older S5 was already a super sneaky L-mount Sony and Nikon competitor. But the S5 II transforms this camera into a leader among the other brands. Much, much, much more on that very soon. Now, shooting with this new camera actually got us thinking about our storage and backups. Because as I'll talk about in a moment, the cameras themselves are important for our personal storage and backup plans. And while we're sharing every step of our process, you may find that your own personality and preferences drive your own storage process. But regardless of whatever process you choose or eventually choose to choose, the most important aspect is to have a reliable process that's easy to follow and protects you in case of potential failure points along the way. The first step, of course, is to go out and make great content or else there's nothing to back up. Whether it's still images with your camera or phone or video or whatever, when it comes to the size and the scale of your storage, you'll want to consider how you shoot raw, JPEG, like we talked about, videos. These are important factors when scaling. For example, raw images with the S5 are about 36 megabytes, and using its awesome 10-bit in-camera, on-card video, a one-minute clip is over a gigabyte. So you'll want to consider how much you shoot, how much you want to shoot, and how that will scale, meaning how much storage are you going to need as you add up all those photos and videos over time, also, if you're like many of us and acquire new cameras way too often, you'll want to consider some future proofing because as technology progresses, files seem to get larger and larger. And if you're into processes like high bitrate video and time-lapse photography, you need to think about storage and then also those tough decisions about whether or not you keep the source material or limit your storage to maintaining just a finished product. That decision can make a profound difference to both your storage process and how much you need to spend and buy. And how often you expect to be upgrading plays in there as well. All right, that was a mouthful, but these are all things that you need to be considered. This is not a one size fits all proposition. And just because we do it a certain way doesn't mean that you do it a certain way. So you've got to think about those things. All that said, let me take some time now to go through our individual process. With the S5 II and my recent shooting, I started out with an SD card, both from the S5 II, and then I also brought the S5 with me. So I've come home with images from two different cameras. And already we have a nuance in our process that may or may not apply to you. For our hot storage on these Western Digital My Book external drives, we store the images by month and then by in folders by name of the individual camera. Now, let me back up. By hot storage, I mean our, our main or primary storage that we're physically interacting with. For our purposes today, anything that I save directly to with my own hands is our hot storage. Anything that's passively updated later in our process is our cold storage. So all that said, let me show you some past monthly folders from when, when we owned too many cameras and we were reviewing other cameras at the same time. As you can see, there's a lot going on on certain months and that's just part of how we work. You may ask, does that create some confusion when we want to find a particular adventure and all of the photos from it, especially when we've used many different cameras on the adventure? It certainly can cause confusion. Uh, we're often uh, shooting at the same time with two different cameras, and then the images are in two different folders, but in the same month. However, we're gearheads, and in both of our minds, we tend to associate the exact cameras we were shooting with at the time with the adventure itself. Even down to who had which camera on which day of the trip. We talk about this stuff. Um, but as time goes on, these memories can fade. But part of the adventure too, the ongoing adventure, is going back and figuring all of that out and rediscovering the images that we did capture. For our larger, big, big capstone adventures, we will sometimes break part of our rule and create a separate folder inside the monthly folder that might say Yellowstone. And then within that folder are camera folders for the cameras that we used on that specific trip. So our process is flexible when it needs to be, but the sanctity of those monthly folders is always maintained. And then things could differ a little bit within the monthly folder. Now these MyBook drives 
hang off a very old 11 inch MacBook Air that's been a real trooper for us over the years. Uh, first as a travel laptop and now uh, with dedicated office duty in its retirement. Uh, its processor is nothing close to what you can get today, but for computer managing storage, the requirements are pretty light. Uh, we like using a laptop for this role because of the small form factor nestled into the shelves here. And it has its own keyboard, trackpad, and monitor already on board. So it's less stuff on this shelf, which is already occupied by, you know, a few drives. Like I said, that's the primary storage. We keep it all as hot storage across several drives. We even e recently had to add a drive because our latest drive before that got full. But everyone, this is not enough, not nearly enough these drives can fail. They can fall over. Anything can happen. They can get taken by good intention people. They can get taken by bad intention people. And you might even make a mistake by deleting some files that now you desperately want back. So for that, we use Apple's inbuilt time machine software to back up the entire computer itself, including the external drives, to this Synology RAID array. We've reviewed this exact unit in the past. So for all of the details on that, we'll link that re uh, review down below in the description and some Amazon links if you've been looking for something like this. In fact, we'll list and link all of the hardware and software we talk about uh, in this video down there as well. Uh, inside here, we have a matching set of equal size and model Seagate Iron Wolf drives. RAID 5 and RAID 6, which allows you to configure, among other methods, give you industrial level redundancy. We use RAID 6. We, you could, if you wanted to, you could rip a drive out. I don't recommend you do this. Um, or one can fail. And the processor in this enclosure will do what it needs to to keep your data safe across the remaining drives until you can re replace the failed drive and you won't lose any data. RAID do's and don'ts can be its own video, but I did want to show you that we do have one as part of our process, along with this second smaller unit to back up some of our laptops. So for level two, we have RAID 6 keeping our files safe. This might seem like overkill, as a second set of external drives could probably keep up and give us two copies of everything, but this is our business, and we do want to be as robust as possible and avoid any nightmare scenarios. I mentioned Time Machine. For, uh, for those of you who, not, who don't use a Mac or aren't familiar with Time Machine, it not only backs up your files, but it keeps your chronology and history as well. So if you need to go back in time and fetch something that you've previously deleted, you can usually fetch it and restore it back to your hot storage. Uh, to do this with a lot of drives, photos, and videos, you will need a lot of space, and that's where network-attached RAID storage like this truly excels. Still, this is not enough. We know people who have lost everything in their homes. It's not something we want to think about, but this is your storage. These are your precious images. We know people who've experienced these true disasters. And these first two levels that I've discussed for us in our home are within a few feet of one another and anything can happen. So the next level of backup is off-site storage. And there's some options here. When it comes to RAID, units like this Synology are actually equipped to communicate with a corresponding unit over the internet and keep the second unit up to date off-site. Now to do that, you need a second unit and you need a second site. It's robust, but once I start talking about second unit and second site, that can be logistically challenging. It can be expensive. We started this way ourselves, low-tech, using drives we kept off-site and then drives to bring updated files to those offsite drives, drives. And it was logistically challenging. It added more steps to the process, which means we got behind. If you're behind and your process suffers, you're no longer really keeping backups that you can rely on in case of emergency. So let's talk about offsite cloud storage as a potentially easier way. So along the way, Amazon Photos was released and still image storage on Amazon Photos is free with an Amazon Prime membership, which we do have. Now there's a caveat here that it's still images that are free. So we do pay an upcharge for the size and scale of videos that we have in their cloud storage. We also have our year by year folders automatically synchronized with our Amazon Photos storage so that it's backing up passively to that Amazon Photos cloud storage. That means that it's watching all of our folders and then it updates our cloud storage if we make any changes and it does that passively. Whatever we put on our hot storage just automatically goes to the Amazon Photos drive. 
I do have to note, if you're an Amazon Drive slash Amazon Photos user, the Amazon Drive piece, which is very handy, is going away at the end of 2023. And the service will only exist for photos and videos only. If you log into Amazon Drive, there's more information about the transition. And we ourselves need to go in and assure that our backups are actually through the Amazon Photos app and not relying on Amazon Drive. Um, in Amazon Photos, the storage is kind of all mashed together in the same place. Amazon Drive help, helps you manage folders. I can't say that we're actually not gonna switch to another cloud provider um, as I haven't been entirely comfortable that Amazon Photos is really gonna be an easy way for us to retrieve backups uh, if we need to later on. I've gotta do some more research on that and see what's gonna happen. Uh, we might, like I said, we might end up with a different provider. One very interesting thing about Amazon Photos is that you can search your library for search terms that their artificial intelligence has automatically tagged on your images. For example, if I search for Canyon here, I get photos that we've taken that actually look like Canyons and I didn't tag these at all. You might not even like that. Uh, you got to look at those terms and conditions because the fact that it's crawled through your images means that they're bouncing around their servers and their AI is looking at them, things like that. And obviously you want to be comfortable. These are your personal cherished images. So you'll have to make your own judgment call based on the terms, of, uh, terms and conditions of whichever service or services. Uh, that you're looking at. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is Lightroom catalogs or cataloging from other software packages. Now, Lee and I have like entirely different approaches for this. When we bring photos over to our MacBooks, I just start a new catalog in Lightroom for every new project. I just get rid of the old ones. Lee's much smarter. She generally has one catalog and everything within that is listed by folder in this catalog. Neither one of us, however, use Lightroom catalogs as any side of any kind of long-term image categorization, tags, keywords, or anything like that for retrieval. Although we've seen people use catalogs very cleverly, the catalogs, um, though, in most packages rely on however you've stored your images for retrieval to begin with. So you'll still want a logical and robust way to store and back up your images, regardless of what you might be doing in catalogs and libraries and things like that. Now, speaking of our MacBooks, Lee's MacBook backs up via Time Machine to the smaller Synology unit you saw a few minutes ago. Uh, this is because she's the main editor of our videos. So this hourly backup that happens is protection against losing an entire video timeline that she's worked on, like for MacBook dies or something else happens. The most important thing that you can do is have a process for storage and backups that suits how you shoot, how often and how much you shoot, has a minimal number of steps, and does protect you in case of equipment failure or loss. Like I said, there's some real horror stories out there and you do not want to be a statistic. I know that sounds dramatic, but really we've had numerous viewers write to us and tell us that they lost all of their family photos in a disaster or a robbery or even just because a drive failed. Brilliant, Raymond. I have a couple of things that I just wanted to add. And the first one is related to something that Raymond said at the beginning, the decision of what image and video files to save and what not to save. We used to save every single image and video file, but we've realized that it isn't necessary for us. It's okay to get rid of duplicates and blurry photos that were captured by accident or photos that I simply don't like. And that adds up over time to save space. And then the other thing I wanted to mention has to do with my MacBook and what I do once I edit photos. Those go to my, or from my MacBook to a portable SSD, and then I transfer the files into the appropriate camera folder on our primary storage. And that's all. Back to you, Raymond. Now we turn it around. What do you do for your storage and backups? Do you have a robust multi-tiered process that can protect you and your images from a meteor or dinosaur attack or other disasters? Or is this something that you might need to sit down and plan out that you've been meaning to, but maybe haven't done it yet? Let us know down in the comments, share your process, ask questions to the community if you have some considerations that we either did or didn't discuss today. And thank you to KEH for continuing to support this channel. And thank you all for watching.